You didn't hear it sneaking back up on you again. They just float. They're like a ghost. What were you thinking at this point? Well, you thought it was over. It was one of those things I wish no one gets to see. Was she trying to physically eat you? I'm sorry, but it's really hard to play dead when something's chewing on your face. You're hardly able to see at this point. She removed the whole left side of my face in one fell swoop. I don't know if I'm ever going to talk to anybody else that can tell me that they found a chunk of their head. I'm over 12 kilometers from my truck. Like, what's going to happen? Jeremy, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, your story is absolutely mind-boggling to me. Um, when I was just sort of learning about everything that you went through, I was thinking about how I was going to ask you questions. And I just, it's so absolutely mind-boggling. I don't know how to even ask you questions. So just go through your story. Um, I think this is going to be a pretty wild one. I guess my journey starts really on August 23rd. Um, that was the night before my sheep hunt and very young, I had a very young family, uh, me and my wife and I had a daughter who was eight months old at the time. And I was packing up, getting the last of my things ready to go on a four day sheep hunt. Uh, this is you know, sheep hunting is kind of one of the biggest things for me. Uh, even though I spent 17 years chasing one, still haven't harvested a legal ram yet or got a ram. So uh, this year was going to be different because I spent that whole entire year looking for sheep. I found a legal ram. I knew he was legal. Um, I was on him every couple of days, making sure where he was, uh, taking a lot of pictures of him, showing my buddies, like, hey, is he legal? Just to get yeah. everybody's opinion, because I, I wasn't sure. And, and finally, you know, midway through the summer, we got some really good pictures of him sideways, and everybody's like, yeah, go kill him. So, <laughs> so I was uh, super excited to get out there, and and uh, I put my daughter to bed that uh, that. That night, um, we sat on the couch, uh, did some selfies, and then while putting to bed, we listened to Baby Shark, because that was her favorite nursery rhyme, and a little cranky kid sometimes, so you play that and helps them go to sleep. Um, so I left my house about 11.30 that night, and drove a couple hours out to where I go sheep hunting, parked the truck, and uh, grabbed my bicycle and my pack, and as I was putting my gear on, I noticed uh, my bear spray rolling around in the back seat of the truck, and thinking to myself, ah, I don't need that. You know, what's the chance? Are you, you, were you really? Have... Oh my gosh. Yep. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so it, I was just sitting there thinking about it. Like, you know, I, I've hunted in here for like 17 years. Yeah. I've ran into bears. I've never had a, I only had to spray one bear um, that I surprised. And, you know, I didn't see one on the whole entire summer while hiking out there every, you know, twice a week. So I saw it to myself, you know, I don't really need it. So I stuffed it in my backpack and normally I wear it on my chest. Uh, but I was too lazy to take off my helmet and my binoculars and my all my gear to mount it on my chest like I normally do. So I just threw it in the backpack. And my sheep camp was about uh, 14 kilometers off the road. So I rode my bike in, on moon, in the moonlight, got way into the back and started coming up the last drainage. And as I was walking up the last drainage, I uh, I spotted some sheep. And, you know, they were only like three, 400 yards away. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I was slowly sneaking along the edge of the the edge of the drainage up along the tree line and uh just making sure they don't see me and as i'm walking up uh one of the things i didn't notice was uh all the bear tracks and bear poop all along the trail i was too focused on the sheep you know in order to see that and uh they made it a little further way up and got to the top of the drainage and i spotted some sheep uh or i spotted more sheep um there was my ram he was in the bunch and uh I got really excited and that's all I could focus on. Um, yeah. I'd walk, you know, 10 feet and stand for 10 minutes, just looking at him going, Oh, I wish it was opening. I wish it was opening day. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> this was the day before sheep season. So my goal was to get out there early to find him and just to follow him until he went to bed and harvest the first thing the next morning. So that's, that's how excited I was. <laughs> um, and then I got to a spot where I could see a long ways and he was just working his way along the hillside uh, or the mountainside across from me. And I took off my backpack, leaning against my bicycle and uh, I had my elbows on the handlebars, just a nice steady look and watched in this, uh, this ram. And I stood up to stretch for a second. And uh, when I did, I noticed this little brown thing run in front of me, literally less than 10 feet away. And I knew right away what it was. Um, it was a grizzly bear cub. And I got this kind of feeling over me that uh, 
I was in a bad place. Yeah, I bet. Um, cause now, you know, you got a grizzly bear cub and it ran past me. Now I'm just trying to figure out where mama is. And I started reaching out of my backpack to grab my bear spray. Cause you know, that's where I left it. And, uh, when I was reaching down to open up my backpack, I heard a branch break over my right shoulder and literally just less than an arm's reach away was, uh, was mama. Um, how, how much time had passed there from the time you saw that cub to the word the mom was maybe. right there? maybe five seconds yeah maybe and i remember looking over my right shoulder and i could see her she had her right paw stretched out ready to grab me i could see her mouth was slightly open and then you could see the whites of her of her eye on the left side um like she was literally like you know a foot away from me oh my gosh uh you know i didn't really have much time to react and it was really i mean the only thing i think of doing is just taking my bicycle and drop in front of her and stepping aside uh her head went through the frame of the bicycle and she uh picked up the bicycle and looked at me and it was around her neck like a necklace and the first thing i did was grab my uh backpack and i just smashed her in the face as hard as i could wow were you on the bike originally or did you jump off the bike and how'd that work no the bike was uh, i was originally off my bike and my backpack was leaning against the bike gotcha and it was just in front of me oh my gosh and, uh, yeah, so I smashed her in the face with her with the backpack. Uh, she snapped and managed to get a hold of my right hand. And, uh, I remember, you know, it's holding the frame of the pack and her teeth sinking through my hand and you could feel her teeth just like separating my, my bones and my fingers. And you can hear the teeth grinding on the frame of the backpack. Oh, uh, that was quite painful. Uh, I managed to get my hand away and then I started beating her with the backpack, uh, hardened head just smacking her on top of the head the uh on the backpack it's a badlands ox pack and on the sides there's uh like a one inch tube one flattened like an oval tube yeah and so i was trying trying to hit her with that as hard as i could just to see if uh i'm gonna inflict some pain on her sorry i got a oh you're good no uh well yeah um i got like <clears throat> my turkeys are sitting at the door here watching <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad it was a turkey. Just saying, yeah, the, I'm glad it was a turkey. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Anyways, sorry, they just caught my eye. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I'm being over the head of the backpack and uh, trying to inflict as much pain I can on her, or, um, and then she uh, started to back away. Uh, so I started to back up. She turned around and started heading back the way she came, and I was looking down at the pack, trying to open it up, trying to get my bear spray out or my gun off, um, either or. And then uh, I remember when I grabbed the zipper, I took my eyes off her. And when I looked back up, she was about 30 feet away and she had spun around and was now uh, facing me. And she came in charging. And this is what I call the beginning of round two. Oh, man. Yeah. And I mean, that the bear, uh, her standing there about 30 feet away, she looked pretty big i mean she wasn't that big but like a 300 pound bear but still when she turned and started running towards me it looked like a freight train coming through the bush oh my gosh yeah it it was uh it was one of those things i wish no one gets to see yeah yeah and like one step for them was like 12 feet like it's huge like they're when they run they can run faster than a horse yeah and they can go from a solid standstill to full tilt and with one leap it's pretty crazy. Uh, so she started to uh, charge me, uh, and I uh, I just thought, well, I'm just going to throw my backpack at her, and uh, hopefully she'd just eat my lunch instead of me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I threw my backpack, and I ran up the mountainside, and the, my object, my goal was to uh, run up the hillside, and it was pretty steep, and jump off the one of the steeper parts of the hill and jump into a tree, give me some extra height right away, and... Well, I got up for this little eight inch spruce tree, about eight inch uh, trunk and got up about five and a half, six feet off the ground. And I remember looking down and I could see her running through the bush. You can just hear her. Oh my gosh. And, uh, and you just hear everything crashing. And, uh, and I remember looking down and there she was at the base of the tree. She stood up on her hind legs and reached up with her paws just straight up, grabbed my, uh, my right leg and just kind of wrapped him around my leg 
and she's guided it into her mouth. And then, uh, I mean, you know, her mouth, and she said it. It's like, kind of like that. And she just uh, grabbed right around my right knee. Uh, Which, you know, is, is this, is this like, is this all slow motion for you at this point? Is this, is this happening in slow motion for you? Is this, you know what I mean? As it's happening, is it, Super I mean, is slow this, motion. man, like yeah. it's, it, it was like, I mean, it seemed like when she lunged up and was biting my knee, it just seemed like, okay, when is it going to happen? Yeah. And then her teeth and her mouth dropped around my knee and you could just see the teeth sink in. And I'm thinking, you know, this is going to hurt, but didn't feel anything. You can just hear everything kind of pop and crack. Um, and she's holding on and, uh, she just gave me one little pluck and pulled me right out of the tree like nothing. Oh my god. I mean, gosh. I was trying to hold on hold on for dear life and uh no, she pulled me right out. I hit the ground pretty hard. Uh it was a spruce tree that I was in, so I crawled underneath it, wrapped my arms and legs around the base of the tree, hoping that the spruce browse would protect me. In the beginning, she was using her paws trying to trying to pull me out. Uh, but that wasn't very effective. Uh she seemed to be like almost like frustrated. She reached in with her mouth and grabbed me on the uh, left side, uh, kind of below the rib cage, uh, above the hips, kind of in the love handle area. I guess in my love handles. That's what she we grabbing you. Is she grabbing me with the claws? Is she grabbing you with her? her... With her mouth. She bit okay. me on the side and picked me up um, like I was nothing. And at the time, I weighed 200, a little over 250 pounds. I mean, it was in oh pretty good gosh. shape. And she picked me up and she shook her head uh, like a dog um, swinging a toy around. And uh, she threw me a few feet, and I hit the ground, and uh, it knocked the wind out of me. And um, before I could take that first breath, she was right on top of me, like instantaneously. And she reached down with her mouth, and she grabbed me on the uh, left side of the face. Her top two canine teeth caught me on either side of the left eye. Oh, my gosh. Just, just like this. And when she bit down, she removed the whole left side of my face and one fell swoop one one bite just kind of like as in crushed it all together down off of your oh my god just crunch yep yeah and then uh this is normally where i get my most favorite question ever is uh what's going through your head when she's biting on you <laughs> Nor normally it's teeth i don't know what's going through your head i mean i was kind of wondering you know do i taste good <laughs> I, is it crunchy I I kind of was wondering, actually. Thank you for clearing that up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is it, you know, was that bittersweet? Do you need more barbecue sauce? Yeah. You know, should I have shaved I'm, that day? Man, I'm glad you can joke about this because <laughs> it's got, that's got to be like uh, a coping thing for you, right? To be able to talk about it like this. Yeah. Like it, to me now, it's, it's like playing a video game. You know, I'm just sitting in a drone above it watching it all happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd use humor to help get through things. Yeah, for sure. But, but it's kind of funny on some of these podcasts, I always get that question like, no, what's going through your head when the when the bear's chewing on you? I don't know. It's like half a second. It's freaking teeth. Like, what do you want me to say? <laughs> no, like what's going through your head? I don't know. It's like a tenth of a second, man. Do I taste good? Is it like chicken? You know, do you want a second bite? What's... <laughs> oh, man. Sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So she she takes... She's got your face off essentially at this point right only, only a i guess just below the from the left eye down to my chin or jaw on the left side she's got the whole piece just tore right off um you know i'm curled up in a ball trying to play dead and i'm like you know this sucks playing dead while getting chewed on i'm sorry but it's really hard to play dead when something's chewing on your face just yeah just putting that out there i i, I would probably uh, i think that'd be true yeah <laughs> So then I rolled over on my back and I started punching her in the face with my, with my right arm, poking her in the eye, grabbing her ear, shoving my fingers in her nose just to stop her from trying to bite me in the face. Cause I mean, that, that hurt. Um, and then she had her mouth kind of over top of me, um, kind of over top of my face and she's coming down to bite me a second time in the face and her mouth was wide open and I just saw an opportunity where I could, well, I kind of lined it up with my left hand and I punched my hand into her mouth. And I was thinking to grab her tongue because if I held on her tongue, she wouldn't be able to bite me anymore. 
And so I shoved my middle finger and index finger down into her throat and used uh, my thumb and ring finger and pinky to wrap around her tongue. And I held on and um, I just remember like my fingers sliding down her tongue. You can, you could feel all the, like the little bumps in the beginning and then oh the my bridge gosh. of the tongue, um, you oh know, some gosh. of the scars. And then on the back of the tongue is more like soft leather. And then you could feel the kind of, I guess, the more of the stiffer, harder part of her throat. Yeah. And I shoved my two fingers down there and wrapped, held her tongue. And uh remember seeing my forearm, you know, about this part of much of my forearm was sticking out of her mouth. Uh, so it wasn't quite far. And, and uh, I remember looking at it and just seeing the drool run down and the saliva run down my arm. And then the smell of her, like it just, just a rotten, like a really dirty horse smell, like very oh, distinct. Man. And, uh, her back legs were digging into my uh, right side, into my stomach, and that and that was very painful. So I was trying to push her off me just to get her legs off me because that was really hurting. I mean, you know, the bear's only about 300 pounds, but I couldn't budge her. Like, it was just solid rock. And my hand slipped and I hit the belly. And I could tell as the belly is a lot, not as firm. Um, you can feel there's less hair, more skin. And I reached up in between the legs and grabbed at the time what I thought was balls. Um, and I, when I grabbed it, I twisted and I pulled as hard as I could. And when I did the bear almost made like a gagging, choking sound, um, and a squeal of a pig, like a real deep, deep squeal of a pig. Oh man. It's just, it's something that gives me nightmares, that sound. Yeah. Um, and I held on for, I don't know, a couple seconds. I mean, I felt like, you know, a minute, but it probably only was, you know, say two, three seconds. And uh, then I let go and she ran back the way she came, just uh, squealing like a pig and defecating all across the mountainside, just squirting and running and squealing like a pig. Then I got up right away and I dusted myself off. I walked over to my uh, pack and gear. And, uh, Are you able to see at this point? Yeah, everything was kind of fine. Um, like I stood up and just literally just dusting myself off and like ah, you know getting so eyes are intact at this point and yeah okay just a big chunk well okay well there's quite a few things missing but uh, at the time i thought it was fine so i got my pack and i pulled on my cell phone and decided to take a selfie on the mountainside just to see what i look like and in that picture you can see a large portion left side of my face is missing and chunks of my scalp is that the one that's on your instagram profile right now Yep, that is. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I saw it. I look pretty handsome there, eh? You do. You do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sitting there looking at that picture, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, well, it's not that bad. I mean, I could at least go shoot that sheep across the way before I have to leave or go look for this bear. And, you know, I'm sitting there, and, yeah, I'm probably in shock, but I was actually pretty disappointed in myself that I spent this whole entire – year i guess from april until august looking for this ram i found him you know i spent 17 years hunting in there and i finally found a ram that i knew was legal i knew where he was wow 17 I mean, years my year to get him and you know and i could have really prevented all this if i actually had my bear spray on my chest where i normally carry it and not in bottom of my backpack but no i took a chance and it caught up with me and i wasted 17 years of <laughs> I wouldn't say wasted. I mean, I enjoyed every second of the hunt out there for 17 years. I still love going out there today, but I was just so disappointed in myself that I made that big of a mistake and ultimately almost cost my life. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and I'm sitting there and kind of figuring out like, what do I do? Do I go back to my truck? Like, where do I go? And I had my gun leaning against my left shoulder and I had the clip in my right hand and I'm just popping in rounds into the clip. I got two or three in. Is this a rifle? What is this? Pistol? Rifle, rifle? Yeah. rifle? Okay. Yeah. And then uh, the clip only holds, I think, three rounds anyways. I think it was getting the second or third one in. And I heard the sound of uh, ice breaking. Uh, my hands dropped. They went numb. Everything just came out of them. And the bear had come back. Oh, and she man. had grabbed me by the back of the skull. And uh, I remember her teeth sinking in. And you can just feel them grind and just essentially crush things 
Um, and it, you can just feel all this pressure and then just pop, pop. Like it's, it's so, like uh, when you take an ice train, you crack it. Where, it's very what loud. You, what were you thinking at this point? Well, you thought it was over. I did. I mean, this had been probably 10 minutes after the second round when she ran 10 away. minutes went by? It was about 10 minutes. Oh, my gosh. So I was, I felt like I was safe. Like, yeah. Oh, there's no bear here. I'm good, right? Like, she's not coming back. Uh, so it's probably about, I'm going to say, yeah, 10 minutes. Maybe more. But you didn't hear it sneaking back up on you again. It just, just was crunching on your head. Yeah. The one thing about bears is uh, even in the fall when you got leaves on the ground, you can watch a bear walk across the ground 20 feet away and you can't hear them. They just float. They're like a ghost. It's it's crazy. It really messes with your mind. Now she's got me by the back of the skull. And uh, I remember seeing her paws on either side of me and she's just digging in the ground going, Arr! and just like like playing tug of war with me and dragging me. Yeah. When you have a When you have a dog and you got a little rope and you're pulling on it how they just get down low yeah well she was she was like that just dragging me back into the bush um you know she did three or four good pulls i don't know how far he went maybe you know 10 feet and i was sitting on on my butt kind of sitting up hunched over felt like i was leaning against something you know probably her and she reached over with her paw over my right shoulder caught me on the bottom left corner of the face and uh, she peeled across my face, going diagonally um, to my, towards my right eye, and she peeled off all the skin, my nose, my right eye, uh, right ear, and a large chunk of my scalp on the oh right gosh. side. Just one fell soup with her paw, and then she started chewing on the uh, left corner here of my head, uh, just kind of gnawing out like a dog in a bone, just with her head sideways, just crunching away. Wait, is she? Is she... What what is this bear trying to do at this point? Because it's at, at you know other bear attacks that I've ta- learned about, they're just trying to get rid of the threat so they can protect their young. Is she trying to like physically eat you? No, she's trying to protect herself from from me, trying to get to her cub, and I'm in her way again. And of course, me being me, and and it sucks when something's chewing on my face. I fight back. Yeah. And so when she, when she stopped, I fell back and hit the ground and I reached up uh, and grabbed something soft, my hands up between her back legs and whatever I had, I twisted and pulled with both hands and tried to pull off whatever I had and wrap my uh, legs around her head and neck and and whatever I had, I was trying to tug off. Um, She started to buck like a Bronco and roll around the mountainside and just squeal like a deep squeal of a pig. Oh my gosh. And then I let go and she ran down the mountainside towards where her cub went, just squealing like a pig. Uh, you know, when I grabbed her, if I didn't grab her, would she have continued trying to eat me or chew on me? I don't know. I mean, I never, never really thought about that. It's more of, I'm here today, so I don't worry about what could yeah. have been, what yeah, should have been. Right. It's because I did everything right because I'm here today. So, um, and the bear, she didn't do anything wrong. She was, uh, honestly, I have no, nothing against her. She was just being a bear and protecting her cub. So I just need to suck it up and move on. (laughs) Uh, So she ran off. Um, At this point in time, you know, I'm laying there and I was feeling my face and uh, my left eye was hanging out of the socket, hanging down. Uh, My right eye, I was touching, I couldn't find my right eye. Oh, man piece of skin hanging down kind of where my nose was i think it was probably part of my eyebrows or something and it was dangling there and then my whole uh right side here was all like my eye was smashed uh crushed up into the the eye socket kind of turned up and then my forehead i didn't think i had a right eye and my ear was removed and then this whole chunk of my head was removed uh and my fingers I mean, I had massive holes in my hands, well, golf ball size, and they, uh, fingers going different ways. Like, I think I broke a few fingers. Well, I did, um, but they were sticking out. And, uh, like I the bone was sticking out, or just your fingers were 
pointing. Well, the there's wrong some direction. big holes, and they were just broken yeah. and sticking. Um, on my left hand here, the bones were kind of sticking out. Uh, that's where she crushed my finger in her mouth. So it is all titanium now. Um, so I, I knew relatively where I was in the mountainside, and I tried to stand up, and I couldn't. Uh, I ended up just crawling down the mountainside to my packing gear, and uh, I found my gun right away. And I started to panic because I couldn't put a shell so in bear, the chamber. Bear, bear's gone. Bear's gone. Well, yeah, I, yeah, she's gone. Okay. And now you're crawling down the mountainside. Yep. Okay. And I found my packing gear right away. Uh, and I found my gun. So I grabbed my gun and I tried putting a shell in the chamber. But uh, on my rifle, there's a clip. And you can slide a shell in and get it into the chamber if you had the dexterity in your fingers. And if you could see, you could drop one into the tube, I call it. Um, but it would hit the... I don't know, the front part of the gun, and it would just fall out where the clip went. And I tried a bunch of times, and I was really panicking because I needed the clip because it just the shell kept falling out. And so I was feeling around the mountainside, and I found this chunk of flesh, you know, a little bristly, and, uh, well, it was flesh, and it was the corner of my mouth and goatee and that. And oh I found a gosh. large chunk of my scalp. Wait, there, with, where, uh, where, where, where was this at? Was this, was this, where was all, where did you find all this at? Just on the ground, scattered around on the mountainside. But you're 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 hardly able to see at this point. Yeah, I'm just feeling around, and you know, I found something that was like a almost like a hide feeling. Like anyone's ever worked with deer hides. What are, what are the kinda... chances? What are the chances of you finding that? Uh, that's some, that's unbelievable. Maybe it, she didn't like what she was eating, and she just oh spit it out. Oh my gosh! Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And, and I oh found another God. chunk of my head and uh, like some hard stuff. So I'm pretty sure it was probably part of my ear what? and a chunk of my head. And uh, you're, you're probably, you're, you're the only person that I, I think in history that I don't know if I'm ever going to talk to anybody else. that could tell me that they found a chunk of their head. <laughs> the <ground. laughs> and, and then uh, I managed to find the clip. And uh, I slammed it in the gun, and then the first thing around me that was dark got three rounds. I just shot at the first thing that was dark. And um, from there, I was kind of debating, like, what's going to happen? I mean, I'm over 12 kilometers from my truck. Uh, I can't see. Like, everything's all so fuzzy. Only get the, and in order for me to look forward, I had to hold my left eye. And... Like I'm bleeding profusely out of my head, my hands, my side, my knee, my inner thigh, right thigh had a chunk, had a big bite mark in it, you know, big bite mark in my side. And I'm sitting there kind of assessing the situation and the blood's pouring out. Like, what do you, what do you do? Right. Um, I knew at that point, you know, I was going to die. I was going to die there on that mountainside all alone. Um, knowing that I really screwed up and, and, uh, I mean, what do you do? Like, do you try to endure the endurable? Do you lay there and just let things happen? Or do you end it on your own terms? Uh, so I grabbed my rifle and I loaded it up and, uh, put the butt of it against the ground and I put my chin on the barrel and, uh, you know, I was thinking about my wife and daughter. My daughter's only eight months old and my wife, she was first to love. I met her back in high school and, uh, so I was never going to see her again. I was never going to watch my daughter grow up, graduate. I was never going to be able to kick the you know the first boyfriend out of the house and walking down the aisle. And I was thinking all that and just I pulled the trigger, just just like that. And uh, the gun just went click. Um, at first, I was a little confused on what, what? happened. And uh, I grabbed the barrel of the gun and pulled it aside, and I reached down with my left hand to cycle the bolt again and the bolt was it was pretty tight and I managed to open it and as soon as I got her as soon as I pulled the bolt open the gun fired oh and, uh, man it just sent the bullet just inches from the side of my face um that that scared me I was thinking to myself like what am I doing like this is uh this is uh like I owed it to them to at least try to make it somewhere where they're going to find me. Yeah. And my wife, 
my life deserved quick closure and where I was, no one was going to find me there. Like it's, I need to at least make it across the drainage where more people go. And, and, uh, yeah. And so I picked up with pieces of my face off the ground that I found in these chunks and, uh, took a sweatshirt and I'll put the neck of the sweatshirt around my head and I put the layer of the pieces of my face in there and folded it up, tied a knot underneath my chin to help hold my jaw up because all the skin was ripped off on the left hand side of my jaw, exposing all my teeth in that and my jaw was kind of almost like hanging there. So to keep it up, I tied a knot underneath my chin as tight as I could to hold it up and then two knots in the back of my head to help hold my head straight. Because uh, everything in the back of my neck and uh, base of my skull, it was extremely raw and extremely painful. My things were pretty crushed. So when I tied those two knots in the back of my head, it just helped hold my head up straight where it didn't hurt as much. And then uh, I tried to stand up. And, you know, every time I stand up, I'd fall right over. Um, all the ligaments in my right leg were severed at the knee. And anytime I put weight on there, I'd just topple over. And, you know, I kept getting up, kept trying. And eventually got to the point where I can... Uh, take a step I would slide my or take a short step with my left leg forward and then I'd slide my right leg forward with using my hand or kind of shuffle like a zombie walk and use my uh, rifle as a as a cane and try to hold myself up are you having are, is there a concept of time when this is happening are you able to gauge like how much time is going past as all this is going on uh no, everything was going extremely slow. Like yeah. everything was in slow motion. I was able to kind of calm right down and focus. And it just very, everything was passing by extremely slow. Yeah. So like taking a step felt like 10 minutes. How much thing. time passed from the attack to where you decided that you were going to try to end it all? Uh, Maybe... From the last part of the attack to now, till trying to end it all, probably, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Wow. Like, it just, just slow, because you're sitting there and just kind of in yeah. shock. Like, what do you do? Like, what's what happens next? Like, when you die, do you, do you just pass out? Do you fall asleep? Does it hurt? Like, I was just kind of like the unknown, and that probably would push me to pull the triggers, because I don't know that what do you do in that period of time or how does that happen? Right. Like, I think that's what scares us all is what does that look like? Are you a spiritual person? No, nor am I religious. Yeah. But everybody's got to believe in something, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that for sure. Yeah. So anyway, so you're, so you, uh, so this happens and now you're, kind of crawling away trying to yeah i trying to at least walk um but the first 10 feet of the trail uh goes down a mountainside um right in front of me there was a cliff that dropped probably you know 60 70 feet to a creek on my left side there's the drainage i just walked up that uh was probably 40 50 foot uh drop not straight down but kind of more of a 85 percent kind of grade and the trail I was on was probably like a I don't know, 35% type grade and just kind of going down the hillside. Um, but I got, you know, 10 feet down that drainage and I lost my footing and I fell and I rolled into the drainage and then down around, uh, down around the corner of the drainage, you know, probably 200, 300 feet down, head over heels down into some large boulders. And I found myself face down laying next to a Creek. Well, I can hear the Creek anyways. I'm laying face down on these boulders. Um, my right arm was stretched out. I had a gun. My gun sling was wrapped around my right arm and around my head. And uh, my left arm was kind of stuck back more towards my center body. And I remember just laying there and I go to do like a push up to try to get up. And just the pain, I couldn't even move. It was just, it was horrible. Um, you know, I tried to turn sideways because it's really uncomfortable laying face down on a bunch of big boulders. And I try to turn sideways and the pain just shooting through everything. Like you just, I just couldn't move. And, uh, I managed my left hand managed to pull my phone out of my pocket 
to send my wife uh, a final goodbye. Um, you know, that message, uh, it read, uh, I tried, honey. And I knew she wasn't going to get until they found the body. And I had come to terms with that was really as far as I was going to make it in the bottom of that drainage. And uh, I sent that message and then I tried to play some music. And, uh, well, the song that came on actually when I was laying there was uh, Baby Shark. A song that I was playing for my daughter the night before while putting her to bed. Oh, man. And like all things, it was on repeat. So um, just laying there listening to that over and over and over again gave me the strength to uh, to actually roll over onto my side and to reach up for that first rock that was you know probably a foot away. And I pulled myself to that rock. And then I'm like, okay, well, I got enough energy. I can reach to the next one. And so I started to just wow. pull myself up the mountainside. And then I was only focusing on what I could achieve at that time, setting like little mini goals, like, hey, I can make it to that rock. And then when I achieved each one of these little mini goals, it just gave me the strength to go a little bit further and a little bit further. Maybe I can make it to the next rock or maybe I can make it to that bush. And I was only focusing on, you know, three feet, five feet, 10 feet in front of me, something that I could achieve. And in life, there will be lots of dark times. I mean, no one has a perfect life. And so when you're in those dark times, you got to remember what's what's that one piece of inspiration that keeps you going. That's what I call what is what is your rock that gets you going through those hard times. And just remember that because I'll help you get through anything. Because, I mean, my rock was my family. And one of the things that helped trigger that was the song Baby Shark because I love my daughter and I want to see her again. And that just that power of that just gave me the strength just to reach up to just to, to bear through that pain, that un, that unbearable pain there and just keep, keep going. Um, you know, and eventually I made it to the top of that hill and I was able to get to my feet again. And then I was like, okay, I can make it to that tree over there. And then that stump and just more of the whole entire way. I was only thinking about that 10 feet, you know, I can make it to there. I can make it to there. No, I'd fall over, you know, and I fell in a creek. There was a creek I had to cross uh, 11 times just because the way it meandered through the trail. And I'd fall into the creek and I'd just be laying there and I'd pull myself out and, okay, I'm just, I can make it to that rock or I can pull myself up to that bush. That's all I was thinking about was just, just, you know, 10 feet. And uh, I never thought I was ever going to make it to the truck. I mean, my goal is just to make it somewhere further down the trail where they'd find the body sooner. Um, it wasn't until about one kilometer from the truck, there's these two big rocks, a little bit bigger than a shoebox, and they uh, sat out on the trail. And these uh, two rocks are, you know, insignificant to anybody. But for 17 years, when I ride my bike into there, I'd almost hit these rocks and fall over. And one kind of sat partly in the trail, one was slightly off, and and uh, I hated those rocks. But in 17 years, I was too lazy to move them out of the way. But I tell you, I've never been so happy in my life to uh, see those two rocks. Um, I just, uh, when I saw them, I was like, I'm going to make it. And that was the only point in time that I ever thought I was ever going to make it. And so I, you know, gave my hand a little kiss and touched the rocks and I fumbled the rest of the way out, got to my truck. And from there was a 22 kilometer drive for, for help. What? <laughs> Are you, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, I was on a dead end gravel road. Uh, uh, can you see? I, I, I mean, I'm, I, you, you know, I'm just trying to picture, you know, you, you, you virtually lost your vision completely, right? Up to this point. Yeah. So everything was really blurry in order for me to look forward, I had to tilt my head way back or hold my eye in my hand. Um, The, uh, when I hopped in the truck, First thing I did was push the the um, mirror side mirror away because I didn't want to see what I look like, and I pulled the rear view mirror off. And um, I started up the truck. I remember looking out the windshield, and I couldn't tell where the hood ended and where the road began. And I rolled down the driver's side window and looked out the window, and I couldn't tell where the ground was. I mean, everything was just blurry. And in front of me. Well, well I, I'm I'm curious. So you were saying earlier how you were just trying to get to a spot where you could die, but you've made yeah. it to your truck now, right? Is yeah. this like, was this like the motivation now that you're in your truck? Like, let's just see how much farther I can continue to go. 
Because yeah. your wife's going to probably find you at the truck, right? Probably. Yep. And uh, I was just thinking when I got to my truck, maybe I'll drive down the road and somebody will find me. Yeah. Um, and then maybe I won't have to go as far. And sitting in that front seat, all I could see was dark green on either side and a light spot in the middle. And everything was so fuzzy. I just aimed for the light spot, figured that was the middle of the road. I mean, because you got tall spruce trees there and they kind of, kind of almost, I won't say overhang the road, but they're on the edge of the road going straight up. So it just looks like a, I don't know, kind of like a light strip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I just aimed for that. And yeah, I, I, when I got there, but I was thinking like, where am I going to go? And when I started driving, like, where am I going to go? How, how are you even to comprehend which, I mean, I could just see getting in a truck and uh, you, you can't, I, I, how'd you even know what direction you were facing? I, well, because every time I hunt there, I park in the same, same way, same spot, I face the same way. Like always driving in in the middle of the night. And I mean, half the time, I don't ever remember getting to the place where I hunt sheep or getting home. I think it's just all by muscle memory. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it yeah. so many times that you're. Okay. Uh, I'm going to chalk it up to muscle memory. Yeah. Um, And I just remember when I was driving, I was like, I hope somebody's on the road here coming, right? Because I'm just, I don't know where I'm going. And every time I feel it get really rough, I would try to go in the direction where it got smoother. And so I was thinking like when it was really rough, I was riding in the ditch and oh, hitting man. trees and stuff. So I'd go, Holy cow. so I, so I go to the middle of the road what? where it's nice and smooth. Um, and this road's not exactly uh, straight. Uh, one side of the road for a majority of it is a cliff going off down and there's just a, like a cable guardrail, like there's a post every 10 feet and just a cable going through it. It's really just like to say, Hey, yeah. if you hit that, you're going over. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple quick switchbacks and I made it all through that on a, on a good day going 50, you could probably do it in 20 minutes. That's if you're really good tires and you know how to drive on gravel. Um, it took me about 45 minutes to an hour to drive it. That's not bad. No, not too bad. <laughs> That's pretty good, considering the situation you were in. <laughs> yeah, it was not bad at all. And uh, I thought I destroyed my truck because, I mean, it was pretty rough, and I thought I was hitting things. Um, but when they picked up my truck, they said there wasn't really a scratch on it. What? Except, except for the inside. It was covered in blood and everything. But uh, And my radio was cranked up extremely loud because um, – Baby Shark was playing on repeat, and when I got to my truck, Baby Shark still played, and it was, I guess, full blast. <laughs> wow! Did you lose but, any hearing? I mean, just from the from the attack? Yeah, I lost quite a bit on my right side here. Uh, I've lost uh, a fair bit of my hearing loss because the gun going off right beside there, and plus with the bear pulled out and all the damage in my left ear. Uh, like I can't wear certain headphones because they won't go in. Like they just fall out because the ear canal is closed off quite a bit because of all the surgeries and put things together, all the scar tissue and that. So yeah, I've had quite a bit of hearing damage, but <laughs> what do you do, eh? <laughs> oh my gosh. So, you, so you're, where did the truck end up? So it ended up at a place called Panther River Resort. Uh, it was basically the first resort when you're coming out, not it's a resort. Uh, they have like a uh, cabins you can stay in and tents that you can stay in. And you can rent out and go horseback riding. So I pulled into the parking lot there and uh, I tried to pike park in the parking lot, but I couldn't get between two vehicles because I couldn't tell. So I, uh, I drove past the uh, employees only sign and no vehicles allowed sign. And I drove right up to the lodge and uh, parked my truck right at the base of the, uh, at the ramp going, in and I and I actually this is not a lie I felt quite bad driving past that sign and blocking off the ramp getting up to their place. I uh, I don't know That's why. Unbelievable. That's unbelievable. I, like I was, I was so you know I, I got out and I uh, first, I had my wallet and my keys to my truck and my cell phone and uh, I walked into the place and the first person to see me was a nine year old boy. Um, he was actually at the window and he saw me kind of hobble past and I looked like a zombie at the time. And I was open up the door and the two ladies standing there were like, Oh my God, are you okay? And, and I was like, yeah, I got mauled by a bear. I need some help. Um, and they asked so if I need you, were you, you were able to speak. I was so part way out 
I, I got to an outfitter's tent and I managed to put my jaw back in place and, and tape up some of my face with bounty sheets and toilet paper. And I managed to kind of wrap my face up to stop the bleeding in my face and hands. And so I walked into there, I looked like a, a zombie, you know, I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt and bounty sheets and toilet paper wrapped all over my face, trying to hold it all together. My hands were taped up, uh, I'm, you know, all covered in blood and everything and dirt and all kinds of crap. Um, so I was able to talk, but almost like a mumble talk. How much time has gone by since the attack to now? Well, this is, so I got attacked at, well, I took a picture of the selfie at 9.36 a.m. This is probably around 5 o'clock. What? What? That's that. <laughs> wow, man. Okay. And so, like, the ladies, they're freaking out, and they asked me, like, you know, do you need anything? And I said, yeah, I need a glass of water, medium temperature, no ice, and a straw. <laughs> I, I guess, yeah, that's how I like my water, so... <laughs> You really said that to him? I that's the first thing I said. I like a glass of medium temperature water, no ice, and a straw. Wow! And so they got me that, and then I handed them my wallet and uh, my keys to my truck and my phone. I said, "Call my wife. Her name is Joyce." And I told them my name, and I think I gave my Alberta healthcare number at the time too, because they needed that. Like I was rambling off stuff, and they're writing it down. And uh, then they're had on you the been phone. thinking what you were gonna say like this whole time? I mean, oh, if yeah, you totally if you preparing. met up to somebody, you like yeah, you had already little... you you already knew like if I see somebody, this is what's gonna happen. Yeah, I wrote a little script out. You know, I was just gonna. No, I had no clue. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, like... I, I I that just blows my mind that you would say all that stuff. Well, I mean, when you're in a situation like you got to give them information so they can help you. You, you want to know your name. Yeah. yeah. And I wanted to call my wife to let her know that. I made it just in case she got the text messages because some of the text messages I sent her were pretty awful. Um, and I just wanted to let her know that I was all right. And uh, I want to tell these people who my name was, you know, like my truck's parked out back. It's on the ramp. I'm sorry. Here you go. Here's my keys. Here's my wallet. Just so they have all the information for me. So if I do pass out or die at this point, at least they know who I was. I, it's just a weird thing. I don't know. I, I was shockingly calm, I guess. Uh, from what the ladies tell me who were at the lodge, they said uh, I kept them calm because I wasn't freaking out. They were running around, um, calling stars, calling for the ambulance, you know, dialing 911, trying to get stars, trying to get an ambulance. They were having no, uh, no luck because the ambulance couldn't figure out where we were because we we're in the middle of nowhere. And stars was busy at the time. That's our air ambulance. Um, the helicopter we have two in Alberta but they were both busy uh, unable to assist so they're of course they were panicking because here's a guy you know in in their lodge that's bleeding to death and and they're freaking out so I just kept telling them like hey guys just like stay calm it's okay I'm fine I'm just missing my face so just like <laughs> just need you to focus <clears throat> and I, I told him that, like I said, you know, just, I'm just missing my face. It's no big deal. Just calm down. I'm okay. Um, so they, they managed to make a right decision and they called for a private helicopter, which the owner of the place uh, owned a helicopter and he was, you know, about a half hour or so away. So he hopped in his helicopter and flew out there. Um, while we're waiting for him, they uh, moved me to my truck and parked me out back by the helipad. And I'm sitting there at the truck. I'm in the passenger seat. And, you know, I'm, I got ADHD and I hate sitting around doing nothing. And so they had this young lady who was, uh, had the door open. She was leaning against the door and she was supposed to be there to, you know, if I pass out to go holler at somebody, I'm not sure. Um, but she was there and it was like, I was asking her questions like, you know, what's your name? How old are you? You know, what do you like to do for fun? And I was getting like one word answers out of her. Right? Like, and she just wouldn't keep eye contact. So I don't know what was going on there. Um, <laughs> and I, like, I tried to like tell her, Hey, can you take off my boots? Cause my feet were hurting. And she, so she started to, and then the other lady was yelling at her, like, don't take off his boots. Just leave him alone. Just I'm like, can you at least open that bottle of Gatorade? So they opened up some Gatorade for me and I was drinking that. And, and then they told me it's been like a half hour till the helicopter gets here. And so I got out of the truck and opened up the back door of my truck and I tried grabbing my fly rod out because I was going to do some fishing. There's a creek right there and it's really good for fishing. And and I just Wait, wanted what? something to do. Yeah. Really? 
I did. Is that true? I had to like, yes, it is. I had to like half <laughs> out, and this lady Amanda come out. And she's like, "What the f- are you doing?" I'm like, what? "I'm going fishing," and she's like, "No, you're not." I'm like, yes, "Were, were you? Nice... Were you hallucinating? Were you? Out? I mean, what was?" <laughs> no, I was having an argument with her, and I had my fishing rod trying to get it out to go fishing. Like really, actually go fishing in this really moment. actually go fishing. Yeah, like this isn't like a coping mechanism. This isn't like uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I mean, I got time. I mean, wait for a helicopter. <laughs> oh, wow, man! Like, wow. The, <laughs> the helipad was literally fifteen feet from the creek, and we were in, we were parked right at the helipad, so I had like a twenty foot stumble to the creek, and I was hell bent on I was going to go fishing. And I was wow. arguing with this lady, lady called Amanda. And she's like, no, just get back in your truck and just sit there. Like, just, I'm like, okay, like, relax. It's okay. So then, you know, I got back in the truck and sipping on my Gatorade, really disappointed because I could probably caught one or two fish before the helicopter, you know, I would have oh, tried. <laughs> helicopter <laughs> lands. And I mean, I can't see, like I can, like I said, uh, it's everything's so blurry and I can only see the one with the one eye. And, and so anyways, this helicopter lands and, I go to get in and the whole back seat is like a big blue tarp, right? So, you know, I don't know why they put a tarp in there. Maybe because it's bleeding all over the place, but. <laughs> so, yeah, I bet that's the reason, yeah. <laughs> I get in this real fancy helicopter. It's got four seats in the back, you know, two in the front. And so we take off. Um, everybody's got these little headsets on and I got nothing. I mean, yeah. Uh, so I'm sitting there and I'm looking out the window because I'm, I'm like, we're in a helicopter in the mountains. and there's nice scenery. So I'm trying to look out the window and I mean, I can't see nothing, but I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to move around, look out the window. And every time I lean over, I get this real sharp pain on my left side. And, you know, I turn to look and Amanda be sitting there and she'd be looking at me and she pulled this big blue tarp up over her face. And I was like, well, screw you. Like I'm looking out the window then. So I'd lean over, look out the window and I'd feel this poke again. And I look at her and this blue tarp would come back up. I'm like, I ain't playing peekaboo. Like what's going on? (laughs) I didn't realize this at the time, but when I was trying to look out the window, it looked like I was passing out. And so she was poking me and pinching me, trying to wake me up. And then when I turned to look at her, uh, she'd pull the tarp up because it cough and squirt out blood all the time. So she's pulling the tarp up to protect her. But oh, it literally wow. looked like we were playing peekaboo. And uh, <laughs> oh, I still, my bugger, gosh. still bugger about that today because it, it was funny. Like at least three, four times, you know, I turned and she'd pull the tarp up. I'm like, what the, what are you doing? Oh my gosh. So then we land the helicopter in uh, Sundry at the hospital. And I remember the helicopter landed and you can just see a bunch of people with a gurney just kind of like doodling down like, yay, we got to be here for this, this kind of thing. Um, they weren't, no one was really excited, just like, you know, another day at work. Uh, my helicopter door opens up and I turned and looked at the person who opened up the door and I said, hi. And then that's when everybody just started going crazy uh, a doctor tried cutting back behind the helicopter, but we had an open tail rotor. So he was oh running for, to run around. Um, Amanda was sitting in the back seat beside me. She jumps out, dives underneath the helicopter, takes out this doctor, like rugby tackles him and knocks him down. She's trying to hold everybody back. What? The pilot's trying to shut things down. The co-pilot's jumping out, trying to stop people because like it was just mad chaos. And... They're trying to pull me out of the helicopter, but my right leg now was seized forward and I had to lift it up over the seat to get out to turn and I couldn't do it. Um, so then uh, I was like, I'm, I'm trying and Amanda's like, just leave him alone. He can get out. Just leave him be. And I managed to kind of turn slightly and this little nurse, maybe five feet tall, five foot two ish, picked me up like I was nothing and slid me out backwards out of the passenger door of the helicopter. Wow. And they laid me in a gurney and brought me into the hospital. And then from there, uh, they threw me in an ambulance and shipped me off to Calgary, which is where I live, to the Foothills Hospital. And I arrived there pretty late in the evening. Um, yeah, I rode into there. And from there, you know, into surgery and then surgery into... Uh, the, the, I was in the burn unit for five weeks um, in recovery. And then from there, out running around like a crazy maniac. I mean, I from what I saw, the pictures, to what you look like right now, they've done an amazing job. They did. 
I mean, I mean, it's I, it's legitimately next level stuff. I mean, it, it it's very based good, like, on what you're describing to me. It it doesn't. I mean, that's a, that that's it, unbelievable. What was really funny right before we go to get out of the hospital, um, the surgeon that stitched me up, he stitched me up, did the two surgeries, and then he went on holidays for two weeks, uh, and then he, he was back. And uh, there was a picture of me on the wall with my wife and daughter uh, just before the bear attack. And he looked at it and he says, you know, I could have done a better job if I had this picture. <laughs> 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 it was really good. Like, that doctor was awesome. Um, partway through, uh, this part of my head here on the right side, kind of from, I guess, my forehead to partly to the back, that was all removed and that was uh, – it was just skull and skin or skull and meat, uh, no skin. They didn't know what to do with that till September 24th. They brought me in for surgery and they tried taking a chunk of my head here and moving it over because uh, skin doesn't grow on bone and needs blood flow. And that piece of my head started to die. So they moved it back and then they took a, a chunk of skin off my leg and they covered just to cover it up because, I mean, you just can't have bone and meat there sticking out forever so they did that they closed it up and the next day i decided i'm going out with my friends uh, i had a hall pass from the hospital so you get to go out for the day and uh we went out to the shooting range and uh they, they came and picked me up my buddies and they got my guns and they picked me up and uh so we <laughs> head up to the shooting range and i got this yeah you know huge band-aid i got drains hanging from my face and i'm all cross-eyed and you know, I can't see very well because uh, my eyes are so swollen up. And we walk into the gun range, and I'm looking a little like I shouldn't be there. And uh, <laughs> we shot guns for a couple hours. And then I got back, and I had my target with me. And I was so happy I had my target in my hand because I can actually hit something at 50 yards. Or maybe it was like, yeah, 50 yards. And uh, I was hanging up on the wall. And the charge nurse comes in, and she's like, oh, so what did you do today? And because she came and check on me right away. And I said, Oh, I went to the shooting range and I can hit something, you know? And she's like, you're going to the shooting range in your state with your head, the way it is. I'm like, yep. And she's like, don't leave your room. I'm like, I didn't know what was going on. Uh, about a half hour later, here comes my doctor who stitched me up. Who said he could have done a better job. He walks into the room and uh, he says, where'd you go today? I said, I went shooting guns. And he goes, oh, yeah? Where? Are you? Said, oh, I went to his indoor range, and I could hit a target, and I showed him. I was so proud of myself. He's like, how's your head feeling? I'm like, it's still there. He goes, does it hurt or anything? I'm like, nope. He's like, okay, awesome job, dude. Have a nice day. And the <laughs> nurse is like, aren't you going to do anything? He goes, no, nah, if you can get out, go and shoot guns and not have anything hurt, he's doing pretty good. Oh, man, wow. <laughs> <clears throat> so are you – Are you? were you normally this uh... – determined are you a determined type person like i i feel like other people would have legitimately given up like they never would have tried yeah there's not a lot of things that get in my way i always try to find a way around if i can't do something or there's a roadblock i've always tried to get around um that's how i am i guess i mean it's got to be a, a a personality thing with you that that determination came through that pulled you through all of that to a degree i would say like i mean you just somebody somebody that goes through something like that and is able to push themselves through that and and hike would you say 12 kilometers out to the 12.8 kilometers yep to the truck yeah what is that like probably nine seven, miles or so seven, seven miles point eight, seven point eight or something like seven, that. okay so almost eight miles out i mean you know i hike a lot and that's i mean you did that in what, like in nine hours, something like that? Something like that. That's incredible. In your state, I, I mean, you, you, you've got to have some sort of a personality, uh, something in you that sets you apart from other people to give you that level of determination to be able to get out of something like that. I mean, just naturally within you that you probably, maybe you knew you had, maybe you didn't. Yeah, I think it just, maybe it's stubbornness too a little bit. All right. <laughs> what was it like when you, what was it like when you uh, saw your wife and daughter? <laughs> Oh, that was amazing. I mean, my wife was there at the foot of the bed uh, from day one, and I couldn't see for probably the first two weeks in the hospital. My eyes were swelled right shut, and when I could, they had to clean them out every day, and I couldn't really see. And 
Um, it wasn't until late September when I was able to actually make out my wife and daughter. Um, because like I said, I physically couldn't see, but hearing their voices and hear my daughter giggle, that was oh man, that was something. I mean, like the as soon as they got me up to the walk, which was I think after the first week, they stood me up for the very first time. And uh my wife came there to see that. And uh she was hungry and waiting around for the therapist and everybody to show up and they weren't, so she was gonna run down, grab a quick bite to eat. Well, when she left, not even a minute after she left, the nurses and the physiotherapist come in to help get me up on my feet. So here I am, they get me up on my feet and I'm on a walker. And uh, and they want me just to walk to the end of the bed or the end of the room and come back. I mean, the room's probably, you know, 15 feet maybe. So I got up on the walker, I took three, four steps. I got to the end of the room and my wife wasn't there and I really wanted her to see me walk again because I, I was actually afraid that she was going to leave me because I you know, look like a monster who wants to be married to a somebody in my state right and like that's all those things that go through your head and that you're laying wow. there every day with and and uh, they're like okay come back to the to the bed and I'm like screw that so I pushed to the doorway I managed to get the walker to the doorway and they're like don't push it I got out in the hallway and I got about 30 feet down the hall wow and my wife end up walking was walking up the stairs and she comes around the corner and she sees me in the hallway on my walker and you know i was trying to give it all i got because i wanted to show that i could that i could still do it and it was a very emotional moment uh i didn't make it back to my bed without a lot of help but i just i just pushed just to prove to her that you know and to prove to myself that i can do it and so every day from that point i would get up they would bring me the walker right after I ate breakfast and I would try to walk around the unit by myself with the walker. And it used to take me from breakfast till lunch to do one lap. So I did that every single day until the day they released me. I was able to walk around that unit in 12 minutes. Wow. Yeah. it's awesome. Now today I can walk around that whole entire unit in less than a minute. So just to tell you how much <laughs> yeah. it's taken me three and a half, four hours to do it in to do it in 12 minutes and then now to do it in 45 seconds man it'd be equivalent to walking down uh three aisles in the grocery maybe four aisles in the grocery store so if you're in a safeway store just four complete aisles or basically the width of a 24-hour walmart with a grocery in it if you walk across the long way that yeah. would be roughly the the walk that would be around the whole unit oh my gosh what what's um What's life like? What's life like today for you? Uh, pretty much the same. I mean, there's some limitations that I have. I don't let them stop me. Uh, like making a fist, I can't make a really tight fist in my hands. Um, my pinky sometimes sticks out when I close my fist, so I have to push it in. You know, sometimes it cooperates, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, my eyes don't fully close, so this is me sleeping. I mean, it, it's wicked for babysitting. Whoa. I gotta tell you, I bet. It's, it's, it's when you have kids what, and you can babysit. What's your vision you like? Uh, twenty twenty three. Um, so my vision's good, but my eyes are a different height because they replaced my eye sockets with titanium in that, and so they're slightly out. And when I, if I take my glasses off, people look two dimensional, like flat. Uh, when I put their prism glasses, so they help see. Okay, it, it just makes things a little more detailed um wow. yeah i can still walk and all that like i'll never be able to run another five minute mile again because well i'm just too beat up and too many steel parts <laughs> but then, but i mean just because i can't run a five minute mile doesn't mean i can't ride a bike a five minute mile i mean i can still do it just a different means of doing it have, have you gotten back uh out to hunt uh 48 hours after being out of the hospital i went right back at it Oh man, I I knew you were gonna say that. I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> you can't, you can't have you had another bear encounter? I I have actually. Um, this uh, last year, twenty twenty three, uh, it's been so the, the book came out in twenty twenty two in September, and I spent that whole entire fall and winter uh, doing podcasts and interviews. So I had very limited time to hunt. And last year. Same thing, uh, anniversary of the book. So everybody wanted to talk to me and interview. So I had very little time to hunt and we were moving to a new place. So we moved out to an acreage out in the country. And so there's, uh, some crown land close to us, uh, got called the Porcupine Hills. 
So I, uh, was it the second day of hunting season? I was like, I'm going to go out hunting. It took, it was the weekend and the wife said, yeah, I'll look after the kids. You go ahead and go hunting. Cause it's the first time. Uh, so I never hunted there before. Looked on a map, kind of figured out this is the area where the deer are going to be. So I got out there, you know, an hour before daylight, hiked into a spot. I'm sitting down looking for some deer. Um, right at the crack of dawn, I hear like something walking in the snow and it was like a soft, like a soft walk, kind of like a person sneaking, you know, I thought it was somebody else walking. And then I hear like this little kind of a, almost like a whine growl. Like, and I just, just the tone of it. I knew, I knew exactly what it was. Like it was just a bear, just a curious bear. And when I looked behind me, there was a grizzly bear less than oh, 12 man. feet away on the other side of the tree. I have seen grizzly bears since the attack. I mean, a year later, we were out hunting sheep and we ran into some grizzly bears and that was fine. I mean, you always think you prepare yourself, right? That You know, what am I going to do next time? Um, so this bear is there. I have my rifle. I have my bear spray on my chest. I pop my bear spray out. There's bears 12 feet away. I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm prepared for this, right? Like, oh, I've seen this. I play this a million times in my head. What I'm going to do, you know, spray the bear, shoot it, whatever. And that bear was there and I froze. Like, I just didn't know what to do. I was thinking, do I spray it? Will that stop it? Should I shoot it in the head? Will that kill it? But the bear wasn't being any, wasn't uh, any threat. He was just more curious. And so we had a standoff there and he started to walk around the tree. So I walked around the other side of the tree, got behind another tree. And we kind of circled for about 45 minutes. So I got back what? to my truck. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And he just, he was only, you know, he got to the point where he's about say 30, 40 yards away. And he just, just curious following in my tracks, just, just a, you know, a boar, you know, middle-aged boar, just curious more than anything of what I was. And like I said, you just, you think you're prepared for that. Uh, so I, I got home only after being out there for a couple hours and it's like, I was out there like seven in the morning kind of thing. And I'm back in my house. It's like 10 o'clock and I come home. My wife's like, uh, I thought you were going hunting all day. I'm like, yeah, I'm done. You know, I don't need to go out hunting anymore. She's like, okay, well, I'm going to go and take the kids. We're going to go grocery shopping. I'm going to be out with some friends for the day. So yeah, no problem. I sat on the couch. Uh, she came back about six o'clock that night. I was still sitting on the couch. I have not moved. The TV set wasn't on and I was staring at the wall. Wow. And she came in front of me. She's like, are you all right? I said, yep. She goes, it's like six o'clock at night. Have you eaten anything? Like, have you? No, I'm good. Because that late, she's like, yeah, it is. Are you okay? I'm like, nope, I'm not. I told her what happened. And uh, we worked it out and did some of our uh, PTSD and mindful training. And, uh, you know, that night I had a couple flashbacks, nothing serious, just little ones, but I was more, I guess, scared, like the reaction. I just, I froze and that scared me because I just, I've been through all the training, you know, all the bear awareness, all the how to use bear spray, what to do. And you play it in your head over and over again. And I tell you, that bear standing in front of me there, I just, I broke down. I just, I yeah. didn't know what to do. And so like, I, that scared me. So I haven't been back there since I, I, I headed back out to the prairies to hunt again where there's, where I could see a bear a long ways away. <laughs> yeah there's nothing wrong with that no but yeah i mean ugh. your story is incredible so you've got a book i do it's called life lessons learned from a grizzly bear attack and i do i don't have any books with me right now actually i sold all of them on uh <laughs> the other day i'm still waiting for another order from my publisher and i also do inspirational speaking where uh or keynote i'm also a keynote speaker does inspirational speaking uh where i uh I guess tell people about my story and teach them the invaluable life lessons that I learned. I'm like asking for psychiatric help is not a weakness, but a strength. Yeah. Um, when you set small goals, you can achieve incredible things. You know, don't need to sleep in your passions in life because of, you know, a bear attack. Yeah. Um, and I do more and more work with PTSD. I started up my own charity registered with the university of Calgary. And my goal is to raise $5 million for research into uh, evidence-based treatment methods. Um, we want to make sure we get it right the first time or what treatments would work best with that individual uh, so that we can get it right the first time so you don't have to suffer through multiple treatments. 
um, I guess I wouldn't say suffer, but you have to experience multiple treatments. Um, Cause when you put yourself out there having PTSD, it's hard to do once, let alone doing it a second or a third time. But Sometimes we need several different types of treatment to be able to overcome our PTSD because they need to work together. And I tell you, when the puzzle pieces come together, man, it, it's it's amazing. You feel so much better. You're able to sleep clear minded. Um, it's amazing. And then there's a second part of that charity to where how do you navigate the complex medical system when you're in there? Because if you have PTSD, it's hard to pick. It's hard to choose or where do you go? How do you reach out for help? And so yeah. researching how to make it easier for somebody with PTSD or suffering from a mental illness to be able to get the help they need. Uh, I mean, I had a lot of help and I want to make sure everybody can get the same kind of help or know how to get access to that same kind of help. So that's my goal is to raise $5 million and that $5 million will get invested and the, and the uh, money generated off that 5 million will run their research. And so this will be there forever because all the money raised will get vested and only the uh, money generated off of the investment is what runs it. So all they have to ask for money once and never again, and it'll be there forever. And so my goal is to raise yeah, $5 million. What's your, uh, what's your charity? Well, how, tell us about it. How can we find it? So the charity is uh, the Grizzly Dude Fund. So if you go on uh, Google and type in the Grizzly Dude Fund, you'll see it. It comes up to the crowdfunding website of the University of Calgary. Also, if you go on to uh, grizzlydude.ca, you can uh, find out more about uh, keynote speaking, uh, what I've been currently working on, and there'll be links to the charity uh, on there. And you can also order a signed copy of Mauled. I'm sorry, I can't compete with the Amazon shipping, so it's a little bit extra. But uh, if you don't want a signed copy, you can go on Amazon.com and order the book Mauled. I think it's got a 4.7 rating right now currently on there. So it's doing pretty good. Yeah, I can I can imagine why. It's an incredible story. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, uh, I, have, I have one more question for you. Um, and I, I'm, this may seem like an odd question. Maybe it's not an odd question. Maybe you've even asked this before. I don't know. But if you could, like pull this event from ever happening out of your life. Now, from an outside perspective, you would think, yes, I could totally pull this. I want to pull this out of my life because I don't ever want to be mauled by a bear. But seeing what's happened with your life now, it seems, you know, from at least what I'm hearing, overwhelmingly positive um, from being able to do this type of stuff to help other people and all the people that you've been able to help through this traumatic experience. Would you... If you could go back and pull that entire experience out of your life. The only thing I would pull out would be the suffering from the PTSD part. I wish that never happened to anybody. Um, that's the one part that, that I hope no one has to go through. Not even my worst enemy, but the bear attack part. No, nah, leave it in there. I mean, uh, it may have been a bad, it's a, was a, it was an event that happened in my life, but I would do it again, knowing the outcome, as long as I didn't have to do the PTSD side, the mental health side. Um, and that's, you know, I'd go fight a bear tomorrow, knowing how yeah. messed up I would be, as long as I didn't have to suffer with PTSD, I'd do it in a yeah. heartbeat. I mean, I I just, I, I think, I don't know, man, I, I feel like, I feel like the, the struggle that you went with that bear is a, is, is a way to not only just inspire people, but help people in that direction. But I also feel like this long-term struggle with PTSD with you is, is sort of similar in a way that even though it's a much longer struggle, I mean, the bear attack was a day, right? I mean, you obviously had to, you know, recover over several months, probably years and whatever, but this, this PTSD, th I think, I think you've got a, a big future ahead of you on this thing, helping other people that, like you're saying, that have gone through PTSD to the point where I think, I, I don't know, that, that may change. I, I could see how that could possibly change for you, where you would say, you know, I, I think I want, I, 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 that is something I wouldn't pull out of my life as well, because if I had, I would not be helping all the people that I'm helping with this fund and everything else. And man, I, you're an amazing person. You are, you are, an, you are an incredible person. The determination, the strength, what you've been through your life. I mean, your daughter, she's probably what, eight, nine years old now, right? Uh, Seven. Se okay. Seven. Yep. I've got an 11 year old, my youngest, and I can just, 
I mean, she's she's obviously heard the story by now. I'm sure to a degree, right? Yeah. So I mean, yep. I mean, I mean, just you're 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 the um, the inspiration that you are is is, is indescribable. And I, I'm, I, I man, I'm excited for what you've got ahead of you. All the cool stuff. So and I'm looking looking forward to what the future brings. Like I, uh, I've done quite a few podcasts and shared some personal things and i think this is actually the first place we shared about uh my wife that day me trying with the walker trying to make sure she sees like that was a big moment for me um i share these personal things to let people know that it does get better and if it helps somebody from jumping off that ledge that's what i do it for even though it's really yeah. hard for me it's I want to make sure people know that you can get through it. There is yeah. dark times, but there's light at the end of the tunnel. Yep. And to look out for your mental health, like that's a huge thing for me. Um, just because you're a big tough dude that goes out and fights bears on the weekend doesn't necessarily mean you're physically fit or mentally fit to look after a family or a young one. Um, you need to be mentally fit first before reaching your hand out or looking after a family. It's like the masks on airplane when they come down Put yours on first before assisting, other, before assisting others. So treat your mental health the same way. Treat yours before helping somebody else. And, you know, that's one of the biggest things is get that point across because I know there's a lot of there's a lot of tough guys out there. And I don't mean this in a bad way at all. There's a lot of guys out there that don't want to – they say they're all right, but they don't know how to ask for help. And they're afraid that if they ask for help, it would be looked down upon. But sometimes – reaching out for help when it feels impossible can be the catalyst yeah. of transformation. Yep. It could change your life and no one's going to hold that against you. It's okay. We all need help at some point in our lives. Yeah, man, that's powerful, man. And I know you said earlier, you're not a spiritual person. I am a spiritual person. I believe fully in God. I believe in heaven. I believe in all that stuff. And man, I, I just hearing your story, I, man, I hope you become a spiritual person one day. Cause I could see God in that whole thing. Just protecting you, his hand on you that day, that that whole um, that whole experience, um, the fact that that gun jammed, uh, the, where you ended up today, all these things, and I, I think that we've we're all on this road, and man, I I really do hope you become a spiritual. I I think I think God had His hand on you that day in a massive way, and I think that uh, He gave you a second chance. And, um, man, <laughs> incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely incredible. I, I, I am so grateful that you, you, you gave me this time. I feel honored that you gave me this time and, um, I really appreciate you, man. We really do. So thank you for doing that. Thank you very much, Dan. This was, this was an awesome, this was great. Thank you.